You see all that? That is how many threes I rolled during one of our biggest combats. Hey everybody, this is DM Mike, and today I am recording the next campaign diary, number eight, uh, in my movie room, still. Uh, I've got some posters up behind me, you've got Return of the Jedi, oh no, wait, there we go, Return of the Jedi, Empire Strikes Back, and a little bit further down the road, road, uh, down the wall is uh, A New Hope. I've got a lot of posters everywhere. I keep shifting positions in here because I'm kind of running out of space uh, to record my videos, uh, so uh, the movie room is still going to be the backdrop as of now. But anyway, yes, campaign diary number eight, and we have finished completely uh chapter three which is the dragon hatchery and if you've played this before or if you're curious how long it takes i think it took us two sessions uh to get through and i think it would have actually taken more but there was so much stuff skipped that we just kind of burned through it not that we really moved fast i really just expected a whole nother session but we just didn't go there we didn't go that far all right, so let's get into this. This is uh, the campaign diary number eight. And let me tell you something. Let me just get to the, let me just jump to the chase here. We finished chapter three. And in a couple weeks, when we start up again, we're taking a break. And this is the reason why. We will start in chapter six. Yeah, we're skipping two full chapters. Why? Frulam's a good guy. Can you believe that? Never would have guessed it in my entire life. Never would have put money on such a thing. Uh, if I could give a title to this recent campaign, to this recent session, it would be what the, you know, actually, if you've ever watched Friends, I'm sure maybe plenty of you have, you look at their DVD ROMs, uh, DVD ROMs, wow, I can't believe they use DVD ROM. If you look at their DVDs, all their um, uh, episodes are titled in a particular way, like they're entitled The One where Joey says this, the one where they go to the coffee shop, the one blah, 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 right? Every single episode. That's typically how people remember sitcoms. You know, when you go and you talk to somebody, you know, like, hey, do you remember the one? So they've labeled all their, you know, um, shows uh, <clears throat> with those titles. And I think if I had to give this campaign, this session, a label, it'd be the one with all the moral crises. I think that's a word. Can you pluralize crisis? Crises? It was pretty tough. It was a tough adventure and not because of battle. It was not because of battle. There was more of a internal struggle and battle that was going on between the characters interacting with each other and me, the DM, trying to portray Fulam. Now, if you watch the last campaign diary, they had captured Fulam. They, you know, they were not they, they were doing lethal damage, but they changed it up and went to non-lethal to take her down. And of course, that's how we ended the last session. They took her down, slapped her on the concrete, not the concrete, but the cave floor. And immediately our thief went, ran in there and uh, shackled her uh, with some manacles that he have, that he had. And that's where we left it. So I'm thinking, okay, here we go. You know, this next next week, I had some, some ideas of things, but you know, I'm very loose. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you real fast my prep for this past Friday. That's it. That's all I had. I mean, typically a dungeon crawl kind of plays itself in a lot of ways, but that, that, you know, that's my prep very, very little. Right. So I had no large overarching goals of this particular thing because I wanted to keep it up to the players. Now I had a new cutscene, and I recommend if you're going to watch this campaign diary, stop, go watch the cutscene first, Radio Drama number eight or number nine, actually called, uh, the search for the Morir, which is kind of Nordic for mother. And this is the Fae mother. And there's a whole explanation to this. But that will help you understand what's about to happen or why certain things happened. <clears throat> but um, this was a, I'm going to try to find some clips too of the actual podcast that we had. Uh, nothing's been posted yet. I'm just recording all this stuff. And when I get to about 12 episodes, I'm going to start putting things up. But we started off the adventure right when Fulam hit the floor. 
and the characters began to mop up the floor in some respects. You know, of course, our thief is looting some different people, and our, our druid, Althea, is walking into the Frulam's chamber and investigating it as a wolf, right? And of course, they easily spotted the chute that comes from Frulam's chamber to Langdadrosa's dragon shrine, right? Uh, they spotted that pretty quickly. Matter of fact, this is what I thought was kind of weird. On the actual player's map is a circle and goes down. Like, you could see the chute. And I thought to myself, why the hell was that on the map? Am I am I wrong about that? Like, I, I, why was that on the map? There was such a dead giveaway for the players. And for some reason at the time, I mean, I purchased all those maps, right? So there is a DM map and there's a player's map. And I'm pretty sure I didn't, I wasn't using the DM's map. I had that on my little iPad next to me. It's just like so watch and see what they were doing. But it made no sense. Uh, it's just a dead giveaway. Anyway, that was kind of weird. So yeah, they spotted that. I mean, shoot, it was right there. Um, it, it, but their players did do a role and discovered it on their own, the in-game characters. But the players were like, <laughs> obvious, you know. Uh, but anyway, so they, they um, did their thing. They went around Fulam's chamber. They kind of went into her uh, chunk, a uh, chunk, her trunk. <laughs> I tell you guys, when you're moving, it's like, ah! Uh, they went into her trunk. The trunk was already open because Fulam actually joined the battle. Uh, maybe in your game, you had Fulam run you know she obviously has an escape hatch i uh didn't do that uh frulam is a loyal fighter and um she's not as bombastic as i would say Lenga Drosa is who will just march out in front of a keep and challenge somebody but she does feel um a compulsion to lead and help her fellow cultists uh, if you listen to cutscene radio drama number nine you'll see that Lenga Drosa will come to her aid even in the midst of torture which she had just gone through um, but uh, she decided to join the fight. If you watch the last campaign diary, she stayed, she fought. And, um, and there was reason for that. There was reason because she failed the last time. She failed several times. And so she could not allow another failure. She couldn't just run to Langdadrosa and leave the place wide open. So she joined the fight, but unfortunately a lot of the cultists got wiped out. Uh, all the guards got wiped out and she was the last to stand. Right, so they're going through all her effects. They do find, of course, the map to Greenest or the the plans for Greenest and all that stuff that's supposed to, you know, you're supposed to hand out to your players. They found all that kind of stuff. Uh, the thief actually found that when he was rummaging through the paperwork because our uh, druid was still a wolf, but she was going around sniffing for things, looking. Uh, they did, went through a trunk, but of course, she already has her armor and everything on, so there was nothing in that trunk. Uh, but then came the moment that kind of defined the entire adventure. They have Fulam. They have a high-ranking leader. And so begins the interrogation. And so begins the persuasions. And so begins the intimidations. And so begins the moral quandaries that everybody was going through. Now, we played for almost four hours, which we typically don't do. We stop at about three. But you know you're running, DMs, right? You know you're running a really good game when people want to stay and play and keep going, right? All of us have work the next day, you know, or getting up early and all this kind of stuff. So it's like... Um, ooh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> it was. I was kind of like, wow, okay, let's keep going. Because um, I was prepared to stop. But I'm going to try to find some uh, clips of this because they essentially changed Frulam's mind. They really got into her head of why are you doing this? The, you know, they, they had come in and wiped the floor with them. They kept just de uh, kind of deterring all their plans and whatnot. And of course, they're also there to find Cricket. Cricket is also missing. I'll put a picture up. Uh, so they're really determined to find her as well. And of course, the Cult of the Dragon has read all the signs wrong. And it's really altered the course of the entire adventure, really, uh, which is good in my book. But, you know, they, they each storm, I believe, um, uh, Thimbraeus, and I think those are two major guys that actually started questioning Frulam. There was a lot of banter back and forth. Pax steps in and she starts asking our, our, our cleric all these different questions. And of course, at the beginning, Frulam's like, okay, yeah, I'll sit here and answer all these questions and bide my time. Because right before she dropped, she screamed really, really loud. That was the last session. And her hope was, Langa de Rosa has heard this. Other people have heard this and they will come into the cavern, or at the very least, Langa de Rosa will know something's up, All right? So that's what happened, but of course, and I kept reminding them five minutes have passed, eight minutes have passed, 10 minutes have passed, if they're sitting there interrogating her. But at first, Frulam was pretty, she didn't care, because she thought reinforcements were coming. And so she starts answering a lot of questions, not necessarily the plot, 
you know, the things that are happening all over the realm. But they were asking very specific things, especially our cleric who was kind of drilling her, trying to figure out, you know, about her dreams the cleric was having. What, what do these terms mean? What does this word mean? Do you know anything about um, a certain, um, a certain, not prophecy, but uh, some things, rumors that she was seeing and hearing and experiencing across the uh, for, um, Sword Coast? So there was a lot of back and forth. And here I am, as a DM, behind the scenes, rolling a ton of insight checks. You know, sometimes verse against them in their persuasions, intimidations. And I kept giving them options. You probably hear it in the podcast whenever the one day I actually get these up. But there's, I gave them two alternatives. Okay, yeah, you can use persuasion or intimidation. One of those things is going to have a positive or negative effect, right? If you're intimidating her, that may uh, come up with different results. But if you're persuading, if you're talking, that will that'll kind of introduce new different elements, you know? And uh, so everybody had those kind of options and how they wanted to betray it. And I think a lot of people were using intimidation at the beginning, you know, because they just wanted to threaten her. And of course, Frulam was threatening them. But you know what? If I can get to a character moment here, Frulam was broken. Because if you listen to the radio drama number nine, you can see what just happened to her. Um, she is tortured by the hands of Resimir. She has failed. Um, she has watched, you know, she's starting to get kind of a broken relationship with Lang de Drosa because of his pompous, uh, pompous honor bound activities that he's always doing. I mean, she has respect for him. He is a strong warrior, uh, but he feels that he's become reckless. And internally, Frulam is suffering. Frulam is, why am I here? What has happened here? You know, it feels like everything is failing and she's failing her master. So what happened was the characters didn't know this, the players didn't know this, but they were inadvertently changing her mind and i don't want to get into everything little every little thing that was said i'm sorry this is boring you this is actually a big portion of this adventure but they were going back and forth talking to her and convincing her of different things different outcomes <clears throat> possibilities so um and that's pretty vague i know uh, but it was so much that was said back and forth <coughs> sorry choking on a peanut Granolas and peanuts, man, just stay away from them. Um, so they threatened her quite a bit there towards the end, towards like the end of the conversation, almost towards the end, where they're like, you know, hey, we could use her. There was a lot of banter back and forth. We can use her to get to find the dragon eggs. We can use her to maybe bypass a couple things um, if she'll lead us. But during that interaction, as they're sitting there doing these kind of insight rolls and perception checks, the perception checks and insights revealed that they could tell Frulam was going through some kind of crisis. She was, she felt defeated. She looked defeated. And I would let them know that. I would let them know, like, you know, because I'm sitting here rolling behind the screen and rolling threes over and over and over again. And I've said this before, but look, there's three people at the table telling a story. Me, the players, and the dice. And the dice decided to go and take these things in a different direction. And, and the players too, not me. Players and the dice are the ones that kind of completely changed things and I'll tell you to be honest it was tough for me because it caught me off guard and I was trying to feel like God would Frulam would Frulam say this would Frulam go in that direction um, but then as everything was unfolding and these conversations were happening back and forth I realized how, how broken she was becoming that the the, um, the casting of doubt began to form in her mind and she began to see these guys, these people, differently. She began to see the cult, the cult and its purpose differently. And I wouldn't say she's had a full conversion, but there was a major change that happened. And so eventually what, what eventually happened is that they unshackled her. They allowed her to lead them through the rest of the cavern. Now, this is after a lot of perception and insight checks to see, is she telling the truth? Can we trust her? All those things that everybody was rolling. And I was rolling so poorly, I pretty much had to say, yeah, you, you can look at her and there seems to be this sense of defeat. You think you can trust her. She doesn't seem to be making any kind of moves in any direction. Sudden movement, she doesn't even want her weapon. She looks defeated. And if, if I can find this clip, I want to put it up there because there was a moment in the game where Thimbraeus and Storm were like, okay, we're going to let her go. We're going to let her go and we're going to use her to lead us. And of course, there's discussion behind the scenes as players like, hey, yeah, as soon as we're done with her, we're killing her. She's done, right? That was the original plan. They had broken her, but they were still planning to kill her. 
And then Althea and Pax are having a conversation in Fulam's chamber about, hey, look, I don't care what they do with these, this, this woman. I need to find, this is Althea, I need to find the cricket. We need to move. We need to get through this chamber and get to where we need to go. So they come out, they come, oh, sorry, they come out from Fulam's chamber and here they're unchaining her and letting her join the group. And Pax had enough of it. And this is when we kind of, we actually stopped the game and we just had this conversation about alignment. We had this conversation about, you know, Pax's character is there, hates all evil wants to destroy all evil. And we're allowing a person who is ready to rise Tiamat from wherever to join their group, even in a small fashion, to come along and, and join the group. And so we had, to, we had to stop the game and we had to sit there and talk about, well, you know, what's your alignment? What, do you, what, was, what would you think? I mean, is your character, the most important question I ask, this is what I pose to Pax as we're all kind of talking about this is, you know, she wants to destroy evil, she wants to destroy anybody associated with it but i looked at her and i said does your character have any concept would she accept any concept of grace does she feel that yes she wants to destroy evil but does she have it in her heart and her mind that people can change that give them grace can can they make a a huge huge change in their lives and you know the conversation went around the table like that and it was a good conversation to have, and it really just added more to the flavor, the atmosphere, and unbeknownst to me, I think it added a lot of tension too, right? It added a lot of tension because they allowed her to join the group, but they also said, lead us through, and Fulam could have led them into trap after trap after trap, and every time they came to a corridor, every time they came to the doorway, every time they turned left or right, they were wondering, will she betray us? And I think that was a tension that just manifested itself organically and stayed there for an hour in the game. And it was phenomenal. I'm sure you guys have had similar things, right? This is phenomenal. I think this is great stuff. So long story short, we finished that conversation. We got back into the game. They allowed Frulam to lead them through. And Frulam at that point was fighting internally, but getting them past all the obstacles. I had a stack of enemies that they completely, they, they completely got past. All the kobolds, all the winged kobolds, um, the troglodytes, they didn't even go in that direction. They didn't even go into the meat lockers. She, um, right before this, actually, there was one moment where, where they had to go back, you know, they backtracked to where the Sturges are. Now, of course, Frulam has no authority over Sturges. I mean, these are just creatures that are hanging out, like, like the troglodytes. She has no um, authority, cannot command them to do anything, but they didn't even go in that direction. But the Sturges almost, after all that discussion, they kind of go out. Uh, you know, Frulam said, hey, look, when we get to this section, up above us are Sturges. I have no control over them. We must sneak through. So we are all doing a group stealth check. And not, you know, in a group check, at least half the people got to get it, right? So, I mean, Frulam just barely got it. Other people got it. But one person, I think one or two people kept failing. <laughs> and so... Um, uh, one of our friends, one of the players, threw the other player their inspiration to try it again, and she failed again. And I was thinking to myself, well, here we go. We're about to have another big fight. And But uh, I think I've discussed this in my other campaign diaries, but I have a gauntlet. I've shown a picture of it. I think I actually have a video in this room about that. But in the gauntlet, I gave the characters, the players, two choices, right? Uh, every time we play, I have something in this gauntlet chalice this cup that i have a lot of times it's just inspiration there's one inspiration anybody can pull from and you guys can discuss it all you want but you get one free one and you can use it anytime uh, but then sometimes i give them a choice and that particular night i had two things in that chalice i had a inspiration dice and then i had a potion that does double double the health so i think that most of them are 2d4 this would be a 44 plus 8 or something like that so just doubled it up i was like but you can only choose one and whichever one you choose, it's gone. This this chalice does not exist anymore. So they wisely chose uh, the inspiration, you know, because this is the second inspiration they had to use to try to sneak past the dirges. And they managed to do it. The, the last inspiration, after like three rolls, finally did it. It was amazing how everybody was rolling sometimes really low. Um, <clears throat> so they made it past the dirges and they continued to go on. Now here's the part where tension comes in because it's already tense enough having a core enemy foe uh, with you while you're walking around in a cavern. 
But another part that created some tension was she would stop him at the entrance to say to the cobalt barracks and say, listen, I need to be let go. Let me go in there, talk to the cobalts to get them busy, to get them, you know, to ignore you. I will let them know that you are cultists that have come to the cavern and I'm showing you around, showing you where you need to be stationed, right? And there were a lot, there were about three separate times they had to like debate them with one another, but let Frulam go. And it was dicey. I mean, I was very quiet <laughs> after Vrulam would say something and I could just see the doubt in their eyes and like the, literally in the players, the worry because she had so many opportunities, especially when you go to the Cobalt Barracks where it's like, there's like eight to 16, I think, Cobalts she could have pulled from, like somewhere between eight and 16. She could have really have turned the tides on the players. And so there was some tension building there. But you know what, Fulam, through my constant insight checks, was still struggling internally and still continued to let them through. She distracted the cobalts, distracted the winged cobalts and everything. She told them exactly what was happening, what was going on in the next room. She would point out the traps. And finally, they get to Langdodrosa's uh, Lang lair. And they wanted her to draw out the berserkers because she told them, uh, that, look, Langdodrosa is not going to sit by himself in that dragon shrine waiting for you to show up. He has his people. Now, in the book, you, you have, you can add two or three berserkers. I had four, and they were a family. And maybe this is a tip you could do. But they were a family. And um, they were very strong, actually, very powerful. Uh, <clears throat> and what I did was, and this was inspired by a, um, a short story in um, Robert E. Howard's book, uh, the, the, you know, the um, Chronicles of Kroll, whatever. I can't remember now the exact title, but it's Kroll, one of his um, fantasy characters that came before Conan. And there's a brief story in there. I think it's actually the first or second story. I, maybe I could find it, put the title up, where they talked about like the aristocracy. Kroll has taken over. He's the king of, uh, I can't remember the term, but he's the king of this particular realm. But secretly, and this is spoilers for you, so if you've never read Kroll, just stop, just, you know, skip ahead of like a minute. Um, but there's a secret society of these snake men that can take on the form of men, but are really these walking, talking uh, snakes. Sorry, I got uh, to pro tip when you're recording, turn off your phone. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they are men and internally they're snakes. And so this is what the berserkers were. I called them something like the the Valium, uh, the, not the Valium. That's a that's a pill. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? A berserker clan called the Valium. There's Valium and the other clan, Xanax. Um, <clears throat> it was something different than that. Now I can't think of the term, but it was actually a Nordic term that actually meant serpent. And um, so they didn't know that, but Frulam does. So they got some insider information about that. Uh, but when they came to the chamber, now this is what I changed, right? This is, you know, you got Frulam in there. I'm sorry, uh, the, the Berserkers, I have four, and then Lang de Rosa. Well, they send Frulam out, go get the berserkers, bring them into the hallway and we'll ambush them. Well, she goes in and the place is absolutely quiet. She looks around, there's just, no one is there. And she hesitates and she calls the players in. Of course, the players are thinking, well, this could be a trap too. There was still like a lot of doubt, but there was still like this little bit of trust that was forming for the players to Falam and back, you know, and same for her. Well, they all slowly walk into this oil lamp lit cavern it's very very quiet there's a lot of shadows a lot of darkness and then i played one of the box texts that i made into a radio drama uh, that described the dragon shrine and what was there and then uh, the thief was kind of looking around watching looking at the shrine he did detect the trap fulam actually said you know, in the, in the description of the box text it says hey over there's a chest you know it's but fulam said hey don't touch it it's trapped it's by an ass by acid do not touch that. I will disarm it for you. Um, but, but they did that at the end. So they're looking around and it's very, very quiet. But then suddenly, and this was inspired by Indiana Jones. Um, Storm, our big tank, is looking at the mosaic of all these dragons. He's pretty, he's up close to it. All of a sudden a hand just comes out and grabs his throat and pushes him back. And they see these yellow reptilian eyes open up and Langa Rosa steps out of the mosaic. 
And it wasn't a trick. It wasn't magic or anything like that. But because of all the dragon symbols, he blended in. Just like in Temple of Doom, if you watch that scene where Indiana Jones is in his, own, in his room and, that, and the thuggy kind of walks out of the painting because he just blended in. That's exactly what happened. And um, kind of they had their altercation there. And Length Rosso suddenly was like, Frulam, what are you doing? And betrayal. There was this th betrayal all around. Langdon Drosa, who came to her aid, suddenly sees Frulam, who has sided with her enemy. And Frulam can barely face him. She kind of turned to her side and looked down. And he knew. Langdon Drosa knew what was occurring. And when he pushed Storm away, they had this conversation afterward, he kind of held his hand out like this. And this came from another inspiration. Let me tell you something right now. If you're a DM, you've never watched this show, this movie, it's an hour and a half, it's tight, it's perfect. You need to go watch Ninja Scroll, right? What I love about that movie is that the eight demons have their own unique powers, right? They're, 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 they're each powerful boss level, really, stuff. So they each have their own unique powers. And so what I do with Lang de Rosa, this is his final stand. This is his territory. Um, and he knows that things bad, bad things can happen at this point. Well, I gave him similar powers as to one of the uh, first demons uh, that Jube, uh, the main character, meets with the double-bladed sword. He's huge, he's massive, and he could turn his, his face into rock, his skin into rock. I took those two elements from that film, and I find that film to be very, very inspirational. Every time I want to do a big boss fight, I think about that film. I look at the unique powers that were given to them, and I try to apply that to my own characters. And so, yeah, I stole a great idea. And... Um, when he, when um, uh, Lang Drosa had his hand out like this, what they didn't realize is that he'd already thrown his double-bladed sword and it was hovering and coming back to him. And so he uh, eventually, um, as soon as the combat started, Lang Drosa's first attack was that spinning sword, huge sword, coming and smacking Storm and <laughs> catching it. And if you've seen that movie, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a pretty deadly weapon. So how to describe this battle? It was intense. And this is what I would almost describe as one of the perfect battles. It was. Not because people dropped, because one person did, Pax our Cleric, did drop uh, pretty brutally by some of the Berserkers. But because of the dynamics involved. It wasn't just me hitting players, players hitting me. There was, because of Frulam's actions, this possible enemy that was in their midst, that was possibly becoming friends. And then them being attacked by four berserkers and Lang de Drosa, Frulam could have turned at any moment. And so it's interesting how it worked out too, because you know, here's my DM screen, right? At the top of the DM screen, I think was um, Thimbraeus, our thief. And then it went down the line, berserker, all my characters, Lang de Drosa, blah. and the very last person was Frulam. She had like the lowest initiative score. And as we ticked away on that DM screen, all these players going, player, NPC, NPC, and we're getting closer to Frulam. I think there was like, what is she going to do? This thought was going through. It's getting closer to her turn. What is she going to do? Is she going to join with the Berserkers or is she going to join with us? And when it got to her turn, Frulam had finally made up her mind after seeing the brutality and remembering what Resimir did and everything the players had done had finally broken the spirit. And literally, I think the hold the cult had over her. She picks up her pole arm and joins the heroes. And it was a pretty cool moment. I never would have guessed. I never would have set something up, like set that up before beforehand at all. And there were so many times that, that the table, these are the, this is what DMs live for, right? There were so many times at the table, people were like, yes, like, ooh, like, that's what you live for you know it's great storytelling and it's not just me it's the players and it's the dynamic so this was a pretty i want to say epic but it's not like they were fighting a dragon it just there were so many things at play that it just turned out to be a great battle right i'm not going to i'm not going to describe all the battle but it just turned out to be great um i mean there was one time althea was kicking ass sorry i mean she was doing really really well she would fire off um uh, what's that called? Um, thunder wave, you know, a thunder wave heal, thunder wave heal. She was just, and she kept hitting one berserker, two berserkers in particular, but one guy 
she just kept hitting over and over again and he was getting pissed this berserker i mean because he would she would knock his companion back and hit him but he would survive each one but he was just trying to get to her and she just blow him back and blow him back and it was just it, it was insane and um you know a lot of the characters took some pretty solid hits but again the same thing happened to me that happened to me at the beginning of the game i kept rolling low and i'm gonna tell you something i'm not a dm who's set out to kill his characters you know I'm not that kind of guy, but I am going to just play the fights as I play them. Just Here's the dice roll. But there's something happening. When you, you do that, though, there is a flip side to that. When you just accept the roll it is, you're not fudging anything behind the screen. Sometimes those big heavies come off as wimps because you're just rolling so poorly, you know? So that's that's the give and take of, you know, not fudging the rolls. And I can understand why a demon would do that behind the scenes because you want your bad guy to be hitting the enemy. And when you miss over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, it's really frustrating. But, you know, they eventually took down everybody one by one. And with the, the Berserkers being snake men, everybody had to create. Whoever did the killing blow had to do a, a deck saving throw because what happened was when they kill the person, their head immediately turns serpent-like into the snake like a giant human-sized snake head and lashes out that last final attack and everybody who took them out they already knew about this so i gave it advantage on the roll because they knew what to expect but they had to beat like a dc 16 or dc 18 something like pretty kind of high uh with advantage uh to avoid this like this 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 python like head coming at them and um there's only, I think, two times that it happened because they usually killed them from range or something like that. Uh, but uh, they all succeeded. Nobody kind of got the, the, the python like in the face or something like that. Some people got pretty darn close. But it was, a, it was an emotional battle, I think. It was, it, was, <clears throat> it was, even for me as a DM, I found it difficult for Frulam, which this is weird. I know this is weird. But I felt like, oh, man, every time I rolled the dice... Make, Frulam making these decisions to attack the Berserkers. Frulam uh, making these decisions, decisions to attack Lang Drosa, which is one of the last things she did. Uh, she didn't kill him, but there was like, after all the Berserkers were dead, there was no choice. Uh, there was one cool moment, though, that um, our cleric, uh, <laughs> she loves doing, um, oh, what is it? Uh, it's a touch spell, and it's... Uh, uh, inflict wounds there it was and she always imagined that imagined how she inflicts this spell is that she kind of hits the person with her mace touches the end of the mace and it kind of goes through the mace and hits the person right so she's not like oh you know here boop t touching the person but you know that way and i was fine with that well there was one moment where this big berserker was like right in front of her and she's like all right i'm inflicting wounds and so wham she hits him with the uh, with the um hammer and the berserker's standing there and she rolls a one and i think so she rolled a one, so I was like, ooh, you know? So what happened was, um, I'm trying to remember how this all went down. It was so fast, like in the moment. But what happened was that her spell didn't go off, right? So it was like, Pff! and so the berserker grabbed her mace. And this was just, you know, it's kind of out of order, but I felt like here's an opportunity for a skill check. You know, this is a major screw up. And um, so like, okay, he's grabbed your mace. We're gonna have a strength contest real fast here. And we each had to roll at our strength bonuses to see what would happen. And what happened was she failed her strength roll. I passed. So he took the mace and threw it halfway across the cavern, this, this, the dragon shrine opening. So it goes, <laughs> it flies off to the side. And now the cleric has no weapons because she rolled like another one, two ones in a row. And I was like, wow, that mace is gone. Well, Frulam later, like a, another round later was next to the mace. And because she was kind of off on the right side. And in that moment, she ran over and picked up the mace and tossed it back in the cleric and, to the cleric. And she caught it. We did a kind of athletics check on that. And I think that's when things started to change a little bit. There was like this, yes, at the table because um, Fulam was helping. Fulam was participating. And eventually, I should cut this short, but eventually all the, you know, the berserkers are dead. And... Lang is the last to fall, and when he does fall, uh, Frulam was next to him. And as he takes the killing blow, Lang puts his hand onto Frulam, and you can see his claws kind of come down 
her 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 chest armor blood is just kind of trailing down almost like you know i cannot believe you betrayed me and he eventually falls Lenga Drosa never took a swipe at her until the very end when he realized the, the, the enormity of what she had done and the betrayal at hand. He threw out his uh, sword again, it spun around, and raked up her back, destroyed her armor, and she took a lot of damage from that. And that's when I think uh, Frulam turned on him completely because there was no more goofing around. So um, they didn't find Cricket. Um, uh, Althea's necklace that was given to her was glowing, but... There was a new fairy that had come from the Fey Wilds. You, you listen to cutscene number nine, you'll know what I'm talking about. And she was there looking for Cricket as well. I don't want to go too much in that territory because it's spoiler territory, but she was there. And so now they befriended a new fairy that seemed to have come out of nowhere. And this fairy, I haven't given her a name yet. Well, they don't know the name, but she said she was Cricket's sister and she could feel her pain from the Fey Wilds and had come to look for her because this was immensity. This it felt like the, her sister was dying. So she broke out of her own realm to come look for her. And uh, this Fae looked at Althea and she is the Morir, the, the Fae mother. And she looked at the ring that Althea had and she could tell, she knew immediately, you are the Morir. And she knew there was a bond there. So temporarily now, this new Fae has bonded with Althea until they find Cricket. And Cricket actually has been moved to Chapter 6, which is the, uh, the castle. You know, I'm not going to try to pronounce that castle's name. It starts with an N. It's like Natier or something like that. So Cricket has been moved to this, to this, this castle. Um, and that's where we kind of ended it. It ended there. And, you know, Frulam and Storm kind of clasped hands uh, towards the end there. You know, there was this moment of, you know, you can leave Frulam. You've proven yourself. You can run. Of course, Frulam knows she's going to be hunted down. Or you can join us. And Frulam kind of walked away from them, looked down one of the paths where it led down to the dragon hatchery, turned, stormed, kind of tossed her halberd at her. She caught it. She said, hey, down this way, we got dragons to kill. There it was. And they went down and finished it off. It was a really good session. It probably sounds like not, not, not a lot happened, but man, I'm telling you, a lot happened. Uh, behind the scenes, between characters, between players. I won't forget this session for a long time. I, I think, you know what makes for a good session? Is the DMs and the players working together and telling a story. The dice, the players, the DM, all in this kineticism with one another. And it just unfolds things that you would never have guessed. So I walked away befuddled amazed, excited, but scared. Uh, scared in a way like, wow, this changes everything. And if I've, I think you've seen a video of mine where I showed my initiative cards that are laminated. Well, this week we had a new card added to our heroes. Frulam, completely laminated uh, initiative card. I never would have guessed that in a million years. If you'd given me a million guesses, never would have said, oh yeah, Frulam's gonna join them. <laughs> I thought she was gonna die. So here we are, this is where we're at. And what does this do? Perhaps maybe this will happen to you. What does this do? Let me tell you something. You got a high ranking individual, doesn't know everything, but has a, you have a high ranking individual suddenly in your midst. Well, this changes the game. And in my game, here's what happens. I just finished chapter three. Now I'm gonna be skipping chapter four. I'm gonna be skipping chapter five. And we're going right to chapter six. So. In a lot of ways, it's cut down content. Um, but in other ways, like I, I had prepared for chapter six. I, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. I mean, I had it in my head, but I hadn't quite planned it all out. I was looking at chapter four. So uh, we're going to take a little bit of an extended break because I need time because well, I'm moving. But also, I need to get my head wrapped around chapter six. So because of the player's actions, man, everything changed. Frulam is now a, a good guy. And... We are now skipping a bunch of content. I showed them the packet of things they would have missed. I think I just said that. Uh, it was amazing. So to me, maybe some DMs would be like, oh, man, I wanted to do the whole book. You know, I want to do the whole chapter. No, this is great. It's terrifying in a lot of ways because um, you don't want... It would be a mistake for any DM to have a high-ranking um, 
uh, enemy in the player's midst in part of their group and give away the entire plot. Like, that's not my intentions at all. But I love it when the enemies become heroes. They, they switch to the good side. I love that, but I didn't think it was going to happen in Horde of the Dragon Queen. So, I don't know, guys. I There are more highlights. There are more things that happen, but that that's the, the major things. And I wish I could kind of translate to you like just the feeling at the table of all this deception that could have happened and the changes in characters and whatnot. It was just really, really good. And I hope we have more of those to come. So if you're running Chapter 3, uh, Four to the Dragon Queen, uh, just keep that in mind. Something, you know, anything can happen. Anything can change. All right, guys, that's it. I think I'm going to wrap it up here. This is pretty long. It's pretty long here. I don't think I'm going to do much editing here. But um, so now uh, we will, we're going to take a break. We're not going to play again for another two or three weeks, practically because I'm moving and, you know, I'm going to run out of spaces to record and, and I need prep. I need prep time. If you've seen my radio dramas and kind of how I run a game, it's, 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 it's a lot of prep. And plus I got to read Chapter 4 chapter five and chapter six, you know, make sure I'm not missing things, but also to prep for the next chapter. So I'm excited to see where this goes and excited to see, even though I'm running her, like what Fulan will do and, and what the players will do and what happens when they go talk to Leoselin and, you know, what will the factions do? This is intri- I don't know. I'm not trying to sound braggadocious, but this is intriguing stuff to me. So anyway, guys, that's it. So what's going to happen next is, so you've got a campaign diary, right? I'm most likely, um, well, maybe highlight some more of the radio dramas that were personal to my characters, my players. So we'll kind of highlight that. Um, and then whatever else comes to mind. I mean, there's always stuff, right? There's always stuff. All right, guys, apologize about the length, but a lot happened, right? So anyway, guys, that's it. Um, more videos to come, and I'll see you. I'll see you in the next video.